Okay, yesterday I argued that there are things that matter because there are animals. Entities whose existence and condition can be good or bad for them, depending on how well they're functioning. That's because these entities function by having an evaluative awareness that tracks their own functioning and the things that promote or interfere with it, and so enables them to pursue their own good condition as a final end. The way things are matters because it matters to animals, human animals among them. Value comes into the world with conscious, sentient life. Now, most animals, of course, are not conscious of all this, an animal is conscious of the world and of the thing and the things in the world seem attractive or aversive to her depending on how those things affect her good and she acts accordingly seeking what is good for her and avoiding what's bad at least so long as she's well functioning and perceives things rightly but she doesn't know that that's what she's doing or why she acts as she does human beings however have a special form of self-consciousness that makes us aware of the motives on which we act and capable of evaluating those motives and deciding whether they count as good reasons or not and of acting accordingly. This makes us persons, that is normatively self-governing or autonomous agents who have moral obligations and can take responsibility for what we do and what we are. Human beings, I argued, lead a different form, kind of life from the other animals because we respond evaluatively or normatively, not only to things in the world, but to ourselves, thinking of ourselves as good or bad, successful or unsuccessful, worthy or unworthy persons. This gives a special character to the kind of importance that we have for ourselves and to the way in which what we do and what happens matters to us. But it's not a form of superiority, something that makes us more important absolutely than the other animals, it's simply a different form of life. Supposing these are the similarities and differences, then how do they bear on the question how we should treat the other animals? Now, because the argument I'm about to give is grounded in Immanuel Kant's moral philosophy, I'm going to start by introducing Kant's idea of moral standing, namely being an end in yourself. Kant argued famously that persons are marked out by their natures as ends in themselves. Once we see what this means and why it's so, we can ask whether animals might also be ends in themselves. Now, perhaps no theme of Kant's moral philosophy resonates more clearly with our ordinary moral ideas than Kant's dictum that a human being should never be used as a mere means to an end. You're just using me is one of the most familiar forms of moral protest. Nearly any modern person, if asked to make a list of practices that are obviously wrong, would put slavery on the list. And Aristotle never seems so alien to us as when he complacently remarks that the slave is a living tool. A person we now feel strongly is not just a tool to be used for the achievement of other people's ends. Now, of course, we do use each other as means to our ends all the time. The cab driver who drives you to the airport, the doctor who treats your illnesses, the relative who lends you money, all do things that help you to promote your own ends. But to treat someone as a mere means, as Kant understands it, is to use her to promote your own ends in a way to which she herself could not possibly consent. Kant argued that treating a person as a mere means violates the dignity that every human being possesses as an end in itself. And he enshrined this idea in one of his formulations of the categorical imperative, the formula of humanity, which runs, so act that you always treat humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of any other, always at the same time as an end and never merely as a means. Respect for human beings as an end, for a human being as an end in itself, Kant believed, uh, demands that we avoid all use of force, coercion, and deception. That is, all devices that are intended to override or redirect the autonomous choices of other people. People should decide for themselves what ends they're going to pursue and what projects they're going to promote using their own reason and we should not try to force or trick them 
into doing what we want to happen or we think is best. Respect for humanity demands respect for the legal rights that protect people's freedom of choice and action. At the same time, Kant believed, respect for humanity demands that we help promote the ends of other people when they need our help, at least where that's consistent with the other ends that we have reason to promote. This is because an essential aspect of respecting your own humanity is regarding your own ends as good and worthy of pursuit. When that same respect is accorded to others, it demands that we also regard their ends as good and worthy of pursuit. Kant describes rational beings who respect one another's humanity as forming what he called the kingdom of ends. Like the kingdom of God on earth, the kingdom of ends is a spiritual or notional community constituted by the relations among human beings who share a commitment to themselves as having a certain kind of value or standing. But with characteristic enlightenment twist, Kant reconceives this spiritual kingdom as a kind of constitutional democracy in which each citizen has a legislative voice. When we act on moral principles, Kant believed, we act in a way that's acceptable from any rational being's point of view, and therefore we interact with them on terms that they can accept. So moral laws can be viewed as the laws legislated by all rational beings in Congress of the kingdom of ends. Now, when people are confronted with the account of morality that I've just sketched, the question always immediately arises, but what about non-rational beings? If the value of human beings as ends in themselves is associated with our personhood, of our, our capacity to be governed by our own autonomous rational choices, what are we to say about those who we presume have no such capacity? What about infants who are not yet rational, or the very old and demented who are rational no longer? What about the cognitive, cognitively disabled and the incurably insane? And what about the non-human animals? Are none of these to be regarded as ends in themselves? If not, does that mean that we're allowed to use them as mere means to our ends? In fact, it's become a commonplace in the animal rights literature to challenge Kant's conception and others like it by arguing that it's inconsistent to refuse moral standing to animals while granting it to human beings who are undeveloped or defective in these various ways. There is no property, Peter Singer has urged, that is possessed by all and only human beings and so no possible grounds for assigning moral standing to human beings alone. In my view, this kind of argument is metaphysically flawed. In the first place, moral standing and the properties on which it is grounded should be assigned to whole persons and or animals, not to the stages in their lives. It is, I believe, as beings with lives of our own to live, lives of which we are the subjects and agents, that we make moral claims on one another. An infant is not a special kind of creature. Infancy is a stage of life. An infant human being is a rational being, although his reason is in an undeveloped state, just as an infant tiger is a hunter, although he does not yet know how to hunt. More generally, a creature is not just a collection of properties or capacities, but a functional unity whose parts and systems work together in keeping him alive and healthy in the way characteristic of his kind. Even if it were correct to characterize a human being with cognitive defects as a lacking reason, which usually it's not, this would not mean that it was appropriate to treat the human being like a non-rational animal. The way that human beings function requires a well-functioning reason, and a person whose reason is in a defective condition is unable to function well. Obviously, the condition of such a person gives us obligations of care. A non-rational animal, on the other hand, functions perfectly well without reason. So the moral issues raised by the fact that animals grow up through developmental stages, the moral issues raised by the fact that all creatures are subject to illness and handicap and damage, and the moral issues raised by the fact that creatures come in different species 
are very different kinds of moral issues and should not be treated as the same. So it's only with the issue of species difference that we're concerned here. If we're ends in ourselves because we're persons, persons because we're rational, and rational because we're human, do the other animals lack moral standing altogether? Now Kant himself thought they did, for in the argument leading to the formula of humanity, he says, uh, many of the quotations uh, from Kant that I'm going to read out are on the handout, because sometimes Kant is a little hard to hear. Uh, being the existence of which rests not on our will, but on nature, if they are beings without reason, have only a relative worth as means, and are therefore called things. Whereas rational beings are called persons, because their nature already marks them out as an end in itself, that is, as something that may not be used merely as a means. Now, as many people read this passage, Kant is making a metaphysical claim here about a certain form of value. Rationality or autonomy is a property that confers a kind of intrinsic value or dignity on the beings who have it, and therefore they are to be respected in certain ways. Lacking this property, the other animals lack this kind of dignity or value, and therefore may be used as a mere means. But there are several problems with understanding Kant's argument that way. One is that it does nothing to explain the particular kind of value that rational beings are supposed to have. Value is not a univocal notion. Different things are valued in different ways. As I've already noted, the kind of value that Kant thinks attaches to persons is one in response to which we must respect their choices, both in the sense that we leave people free to determine their own actions and in the sense that we regard their chosen ends as things that are good and worthy of pursuit. A person could certainly have some kinds of value, even some kinds of value as an end, without it following that his choices ought to be respected and his ends ought to be pursued. A prince or someone held by some religious tradition to be the embodiment of their god might be valued in the way a precious object is valued preserved and protected and cherished without ever being allowed to do anything that he chooses. But the more important problem with the reading has to do with the general aspirations of Kant's philosophy. The central argument of Kant's philosophy, the argument of the critique of pure reason, is meant to establish that while scientific knowledge does have a secure foundation, human beings can have no knowledge of matters that are beyond the realm of experience, no knowledge of the world other than scientific knowledge itself. Famously, Kant argued on these grounds that we cannot have knowledge of such matters as whether God exists or the will is free or the soul is immortal. Speaking a bit roughly, Kant thinks that the only claims we can make that go beyond the realm of empirical knowledge are ones that can be established as necessary presuppositions of rational activity itself. The laws of logic, according to Kant, are presuppositions of the possibility of thinking in general. The principles that ground scientific practice, such as the principle that every event has a cause, is a presupposition of constructing a theoretical understanding of the world. So for Kant, ethics cannot be a matter of having theoretical or metaphysical insight into a realm of intrinsic values and then applying that knowledge in practice. Instead, claims about what has value must be established as the presuppositions of rational choice. And let me put this in another way in terms of the relation between value and valuing. According to some philosophical theories, certain things just have value. Value is a real property that those things have, and we are doing our valuing correctly when we value those things that actually have value. According to other philosophical theories, value depends on valuing. The relation goes the other way. It's the act of valuing that has to come first. 
Now, obviously, the worry about this kind of theory is that it seems to place no limits on what may be valued. If it's not a fact that some objects just are valuable and some are not, what makes it possible to value things correctly or incorrectly? How can we go right and wrong in our acts of valuing? Kant's answer is going to be that there are some things that we must value if we're to value anything at all. And in particular, that we have to value ourselves. In that case, things can only be correctly valued if their value is consistent with our value as ends in ourselves. Now, in order to explain how this works, I want to remind you of a point from my last lecture. In my last lecture, I talked about the difference between something's being important to someone and something's being important absolutely. I argued that important is a tethered notion, meaning that nothing can be important without being important to someone, some creature. When we say that something is important absolutely, what we must mean is not that it has a free-floating importance, but that it's important to everyone to whom things can be important. Kant's argument turns on the idea that good is in a similar way a tethered notion. Nothing can be good or bad without being good or bad for someone. And to say that something is good absolutely would just be to say that it's good for us all. Good or at least not bad from every point of view. Now Kant thinks that because we are rational, we cannot decide to pursue an end unless we take it to be good in this absolute sense. This requirement is essentially built into the nature of the kind of self-consciousness that grounds rational choice. A rational being is one who's conscious of the grounds on which she's tempted to believe something or to do something, in the case of action, on the motives on which she's tempted to act. And because of the way in which we're conscious of the motives for our action, we cannot act without endorsing those motives as adequate to justify what we do. As we saw last time, this in a way is just what it means to value something, to endorse our natural motives for wanting it or caring about it and to see them as good reasons. So as rational beings, we can't act without setting some sort of value on the ends of our actions. To say that the pursuit of an end is justified is the same as to say that the end is good. And importantly, Kant takes the judgment that the end is good to imply that there is reason for any rational being to promote it, that it's good absolutely. As he says in the Critique of Practical Reason, what we are to call good must be an object of the faculty of desire in the judgment of every reasonable human being, an evil an object of aversion in the eyes of everyone. Now, what Kant means, of course, is not that everyone must care about the same things that, say, I do, but rather that if my caring about an end gives me a genuine reason for trying to make sure that I achieve it, then everyone else has a reason to value my achieving it as well not to interfere with my pursuit of it, and perhaps to help me pursue it if I'm in need. <clears throat> Since Kant thinks that our choices in this way create reasons for everyone, he envisions the act of making a choice as the adoption of a certain maxim or principle as a universal law, a law that governs both my conduct and that of others. My choosing something is making a law in the sense that it involves conferring a kind of absolute value on some state of affairs, a value to which every rational being must then be responsive. But most of the ends that we actually choose are simply the objects of our own inclinations. And the objects of our own inclinations are not considered just as such good absolutely. As Kant puts it, the ends that a rational being proposes at his discretion as the effects of his action are all only relative, for only their relation to a specially constituted faculty of desire gives them their worth. 
The objects of your own inclinations are only, or rather at most, good for you, good relative to what Kant calls the special constitution of your nature. I say at most because, as we saw last time, a badly functioning creature may want the wrong things, things that are not good for him. But from now on, I'm going to set that complication aside. Now, it doesn't follow from the fact that something is good for someone in particular, that it's good absolutely, and that anyone has reason to promote it. Since Kant supposes that a rational being pursues an end only if she thinks it's good absolutely, he does not think that we pursue the objects of our inclinations merely because we take those objects to be good for us. And yet we do pursue the objects of our inclinations. Furthermore, when we do so, we expect others not to interfere with that pursuit without some important reason for doing so, and even to help us to pursue them uh, in some cases should the need arise. To bring this home to yourself, don't start by thinking about big cases in which sacrifice is required. Think about the fact that you expect people not to block your way on the sidewalk or to stand in front of the lens when you're trying to take a photograph. Think about the fact that you expect people to tell you what time it is and to give you directions or to open doors for you when your arms are full of packages. This sort of thing suggests that we ourselves take it to be good absolutely that we should be able to act in the way that we choose and realize the ends we seek. We think that our ends give others reasons. But if our ends are only good relative to our own natures or good for us, why do we do that? This is the question from which the argument for the formula of humanity takes off. Kant's answer is that we do it because we take ourselves to be ends in ourselves. That's what it means to be ends in ourselves. Um, he says, Rational nature exists as an end in itself. The human being necessarily represents his own existence in this way. So far, it's a subjective principle of human actions. We represent ourselves as ends in ourselves by taking what is good for us to be good absolutely, by choosing our own good, what's good for us, as an end of action. It's as if, whenever you made a choice, you said, I take the things that are important to me to be important, period, important absolutely, because I take myself to be important. So by pursuing what's good for you as if it were good absolutely, you show that you regard yourself as an end in itself, or perhaps to put it in a better way, you make a claim to that standing. Kant then continues, but every other rational being also represents his existence in this way, consequent on just the same rational ground that also holds for me, thus it is at the same time an objective principle. Now, of course, this implies, if it's right, that your right to confer absolute value on your ends and actions is limited by everyone else's right to confer absolute value on her ends and actions in the same way. So in order to count as a genuinely rational choice, the principle on which you act must be acceptable from anyone's point of view. It must be consistent with the status of others as ends in themselves. And so it must be a principle that anyone could will. In other words, in Kant's own language, the principle on which you act must conform to the categorical imperative. You must be able to will it as a universal law. Kant takes that to mean that ultimately it's a rational being's capacity for moral choice that marks him out as an end in himself. He says, morality is the condition under which alone a rational being can be an end in itself, since only through this is it possible to be a law-making member of the kingdom of ends. That's why Kant thinks that persons, and only persons, are ends in themselves. But there's a problem with this. There are two slightly different senses of end in itself at work in Kant's argument. 
which we might think of as an active sense and a passive sense. I must regard you as an end in itself in the active sense if I regard you as capable of legislating for me and so as placing me under an obligation to respect your choices or to help you pursue your ends. I must regard you as an end in itself in the passive sense if I'm obligated to treat your ends, or at least the things that are good for you, as good absolutely. Kant evidently thought these two senses come to the same thing, that everyone who is an end in itself in the passive sense must be an end in itself in the active sense too. But that doesn't obviously follow. The idea that rational choice involves a presupposition that we are ends in ourselves is certainly not the same as the idea that rational choice involves a presupposition that rational beings are ends in themselves. For we're not merely rational beings. We are also animals, beings who have a good. Of course, the other animals don't have to presuppose anything in order to make their choices, since they're not rational beings who need to be able to endorse their choices or see them as justified. But the content of the presupposition that we make is not automatically given by the fact that it is only rational beings who have to make that presupposition. So the question before us is this. Do we presuppose our value as ends in ourselves only in the sense that when we uh, make a choice, we claim the standing to make a law for ourselves and others only as autonomous legislators in the kingdom of ends? Or do we presuppose our value as ends in ourselves simply as beings for whom things can be good or bad? In fact, Kant's argument actually shows that we presuppose our value in both of these ways. Now I'm going to explain why I think that. Suppose that I decide to pursue some ordinary object of inclination, something that I want. Because I want this thing, I think it is good for me, and I make it my end. When I choose this end, I think there is good reason for it, so I take myself to create an obligation for everyone else. No one is allowed to interfere with my pursuit of this thing without some very good reason, and everyone has some obligation, many other things equal, to help me if I'm in need. In choosing this end, I presuppose that I have a standing to make a law for others with that content. An autonomous, rational, an autonomous being, however, is not just one who makes laws for everybody else. An autonomous being is, indeed by definition, one who makes laws for herself. And Kant certainly does think that whenever I make a choice, I make a kind of law for myself, as well as for other people. This idea is not without practical content. It is the essential difference between choosing or valuing something, and merely wanting it. Wanting something, which is just a passive state, does not include a commitment to continuing to want it, but valuing something, which is an active state, does include such a commitment, everything else equal. Let me give you an example to show you what I mean. Suppose that I decide to grow vegetables in my garden knowing that this will require me to weed the garden on a regular basis. So I commit myself to weeding my garden at certain intervals in the future, even should it happen that I don't feel like doing so. Now, this is not to say that I decide I will weed my garden no matter what, though the heavens fall, as it were, but it is to say that when I take something as the object of my choice, and set a value on it, it follows that any good reason I have for abandoning this object must come from other laws that I have made or other commitments that I've undertaken. In other words, from my values, not merely from a change in my desires. Having chosen to grow vegetables in my garden, I can decide not to weed it if I need to rush to the bedside of an ailing friend, for instance. But I haven't really decided to grow vegetables in my garden. I've not set a value on doing so, 
if I leave it open, that I won't weed my garden if I just don't happen to feel like it. After, if all that I've decided, when I decide that I will keep my garden weeded, is that I will weed it if I happen to feel like it, then I haven't really decided anything at all. On any given day when I wake up, whether I weed my garden will depend on whether I happen to feel like it, not on the previous choice that I made. So when I choose to grow vegetables in my garden, I bind my future self to a project of regular weeding by a law that is not conditional on my future self's desires. And my future self in turn binds me, for it's essential that, that if she's going to do the necessary weeding, I must now buy some pads to protect her knees and some tools for her to weed with. And I must do that also, whether I feel like it or not. In this simple sense, whenever I make a choice, I impose obligations on myself. I create reasons for myself. When I act on those reasons, you could say that I'm respecting my own autonomy by obeying the law that I myself have made. But my original decision to set a value on some ordinary end of inclination is not an act of respect for my autonomy in that sense. I can't respect my own choices or do what's necessary to carry them out until after I've made them. So the sense in which I represent myself as an end in itself when I make the original choice is not captured by the idea that I respect my standing as a lawmaker in the kingdom of ends. When I make the original choice, when I decide that my desire to grow vegetables is a reason for me to set a value on having a garden, I have no other reason for taking my end to be good absolutely than the fact that it's good for me. I said earlier that when we make a choice, it's as if we said, the things that matter to me matter absolutely, because I matter. But now we can see that the description under which I matter is partly simply that of a being for whom things can be good or bad, a being with a final good. So I'm deciding to treat my ends as good absolutely because I'm a creature with a final good. And the universalization of that principle requires that we should take the ends of beings who have a final good to be absolutely valuable. Now, of course, there are some ways we could challenge this. Someone might suppose that it is only my own good that I'm taking to be good absolutely. But if we're really committed, as Kant supposes, to thinking that what's good absolutely must be good from anyone's point of view, this seems a little demented. What's so special about me that everyone should have reason to pursue my own ends while well, I have no reason to pursue theirs? Perhaps more likely, someone might try to insist that we are only presupposing that what's good or bad for autonomous rational beings like ourselves matters absolutely. But that conclusion is not driven by the argument and in fact seems arbitrary. As I said before, there's no reason to think that because it's only autonomous rational beings who must presuppose their own value when we make choices, our own value when we make choices, there's no reason to think the description under which we must value ourselves is that of autonomous rational beings. This becomes especially clear when we, we reflect on the fact that the things we, many of the things we take to be good for us are not good for us in our capacity as autonomous rational beings, but rather in our capacity as animals. Food, sex, comfort, freedom from pain and fear are all things that are good for us insofar as we are animals and that we set a value on. So it's more natural to think that the presupposition behind rational choice is that the things that are good for any creature for whom things can be good or bad, that is for any animal, should be regarded as good or bad absolutely. Now the argument I've just given may sound complicated, but there's a way to make it simply. As rational beings, we need to justify our actions, to think there are reasons for them. That requires us to suppose that some ends are really worth pursuing, are absolutely good. Without metaphysical insight into a realm of intrinsic values, 
All we have to go on is that some things are certainly good or bad for us and the other animals. That then is the starting point from which we build up our system of values. We take those things to be good or bad absolutely, and in doing that we're taking ourselves to be ends in ourselves. But we're certainly not the only beings for whom things can be good or bad. The other animals are no different from us in that respect. So we should regard all animals as ends in themselves. In the Kantian sense, animals have moral standing, and we presuppose this whenever we make a rational choice. Now, having arrived at this point, I'd like to take a few moments to compare the Kantian case that I've just made for the moral standing of animals to the traditional utilitarian one. Peter Singer has argued that animals have moral standing because they have interests, that they have interests, that animals have interests, uh, because animals, including human beings, have the capacity for pleasure and pain. I've argued that animals have moral standing because animals, including human beings, have a good in the final sense of good, and that we have a good because we have evaluative responses to the things that affect the functional goodness of our own condition, responses that are pleasant and painful. Obviously, these two positions are in a certain way very close. Both trace moral standing to something like the capacity for pleasant and painful experiences. Perhaps some of you are thinking that if you can reach the conclusion that animals have moral standing in virtue of their capacity for pleasure and pain from either a utilitarian or a Kantian starting point, then it must be true. If so, I'd be perfectly happy with the result. Nevertheless, I'd like to say something about a certain difference between the two positions, which has both a theoretical side and some important practical implications. First of all, on my view, pleasure is not the final good, or rather pleasure in the absence of pain, but I won't keep saying that. The final good is conscious well-functioning. In a sense, the final good is conscious life itself, a condition that is necessarily pleasant to the well-functioning animal in good circumstances. I think that the view that pleasure is the final good is based on a mistake about the role that consciousness plays in the construction of the final good and a related mistake about the nature of pleasure and pain themselves. I said last time that what's good for a creature must be good from that creature's own point of view. In order to have a point of view, of course, you have to be conscious. So it seems clear that consciousness plays an important role in making a creature the kind of thing that has a final good. But what role exactly? The classical utilitarians thought of pleasure and pain as sensations, and sensations with a certain intensity and duration. And sensations are modifications of consciousness caused in us by other internal and external events. If pleasure is itself the final good, then the role of consciousness in the construction of the final good is simply that consciousness itself is what can be good or bad. States of consciousness are what has value. Against this view, a whole army of philosophers in the tradition have objected that the good cannot just be a state of consciousness. The arguments here are extremely familiar. In the service of example, philosophers have invented the experience machine. This is a machine that delivers a steady stream of pleasant sensations and imaginary pleasant experiences directly into your brain. Someone who is hooked up to an experience machine lives his whole life in a state of happy delusion. Most of us think that would be bad. Similarly, most of us think it would be bad to be hated by the people whom we imagine love us and despised by the people we imagine admire us most. Most of us think that it would be bad to imagine that you are doing a great deal of good by actions that are actually causing a great deal of harm, or to spend your life carrying out some worthy but arduous project destined to collapse like a house of cards immediately after your death. Most of us think these things would be bad even if you are fated never to be cured of your delusions or to know of your failure. Because many philosophers would argue it's not the case 
that it's bad to be aware that you're hated or despised or a failure or a catastrophe to everyone around you simply because the consciousness of these things is painful. Rather, these conditions are themselves bad, and that's why the consciousness of them is painful. It's because the, it's the consciousness of something bad. So these reflections give rise to another possible view we might take of the role that consciousness plays in the construction of the final good. Perhaps consciousness does not make any real difference to what constitutes your final good. Perhaps it simply enables you to be aware of whether you're achieving your final good or not. But of course, that doesn't seem right either. The arguments against utilitarianism that I just mentioned work by driving a wedge between an agreeable consciousness and what most of us regard as a bad reality. But we can also construct arguments that drive a wedge between a disagreeable consciousness and a good reality. Perhaps the people whom you sp suppose despise you actually love you and admire you deeply. Perhaps efforts of your own that seem fruitless to you are actually doing a great deal of good in the world. Are we to say of someone who suffers permanently from these negative illusions that he's having a good life in the final sense of good, but fails to know it? In Frank Capra's movie, It's a Wonderful Life, the Jimmy Stewart character, George Bailey, contemplates committing suicide in the belief that it would have been better for everyone else if he had never been born, even though in fact he's a great force for good in his community. <clears throat> Suppose that he'd actually killed himself. If his life had ended in a suicide committed out of despair, would it still have been such a wonderful life? Could Frank Capra have made a movie about that life? Perhaps called it was a wonderful life? Too bad he didn't know it? Now what does this teach us? In my first lecture, I distinguished the idea of something's being good for a creature in the functional sense and something's being good for a creature in the final sense. I also argued that it's only creatures who are capable of being pleased and pained by things that are good for them in the functional sense who have a final good. If we accepted the idea that consciousness is either the whole of the final good or only the something that makes us aware of the final good but not part of it at all, then you would think that I'm caught in a dilemma. Either I must join the utilitarian in saying that the pleasure is the final good and that the most your functional good can be is the cause of that pleasure. Or I must say that your functional good really is the whole of your final good and all consciousness does is make you aware of it. But that's not right. Those aren't the only options. What that leaves out is that for an animal, enjoying well-functioning and the things that promote it is partly constitutive of well-functioning itself. Pleasurable consciousness is neither a mere effect of well-functioning nor a mere awareness of it. There is no way to say it without a slight air of paradox. An animal who is otherwise well-functioning and in conditions liable to promote her well-functioning and isn't enjoying herself is not well-functioning after all, because she isn't seeing things rightly. George Bailey, the character in It's a Wonderful Life, doesn't exactly realize that he's having a wonderful life, since his life isn't wonderful, or anyway isn't quite as wonderful, until he realizes it. His realization is constitutive of its wonderfulness. Now, relatedly, I think it's a mistake to think that pleasure and pain are sensations at all. Certainly, our sensations are among the things that we find pleasant or painful. The sensation of warmth when you pull up the covers on a cold night, the smell of hyacinths, the taste of chocolate are among the things we find pleasant. The sting of a bee, the smell of a skunk, and the philosopher's perennial favorite, toothache, are among the things that we find painful. But we also enjoy being in the company of those we love, being completely absorbed in a good book or movie, 
taking a vigorous walk, and there's no special reason to think that's because something like the smell of a hyacinth always accompanies these activities, or that the pains of grief, humiliation, and regret are a form of spiritual toothache. Pleasure and pain, I believe, name, do not name things we experience in the first instance, but rather ways we experience things, with a sense of welcoming and wanting it to go on forever, or with a shrinking reluctance that makes us want, want it to go away. Of course, we can experience pleasure and pain in the sense of having a kind of a second order awareness that we are responding in these ways. And in that sense, we can experience pleasure and pain. I'm tempted to say that pleasure and pain are the perception of things as good or bad for us, but always with a reminder that perceiving things rightly is not just perceiving your well-functioning, but also an essential part of your well-functioning itself. Pleasure and pain, I believe, confer moral standing because they're a primitive form of self-consciousness the self-consciousness that characterizes conscious life itself. But what life is conscious of is, in the first instance, not what is good absolutely, but what is good for itself. And that has practical ramifications. As I've already argued, the good, like the important, is a tethered concept. Everything that's good must be good for someone, for some person or animal. And the only sense it can make to say something is good absolutely is to say that it's good for us all, for anyone for whom things can be good. This has important consequences for an idea that's characteristic of traditional utilitarianism, the idea that it makes sense to aggregate the good across the boundaries between creatures, to weigh the good of one against the good of another. Generally speaking, it looks as if tethering blocks aggregation since it's not at all obvious that what's good for you plus what's good for me is good for anyone at all. We do not automatically form some kind of a conjoined creature for whom my good plus your good counts as our good. Now actually I think the truth is a little less extreme than that makes it sound. If something is good for me and not bad for you, there's a sense in which we can say it's good for us both. In that case, what tethering blocks is not addition, but only subtraction. But this still makes an important difference. Classical utilitarians, of course, think that if by taking something away from Jill and giving it to Jack, you can produce more total good, more total happiness or pleasure, then you should do that, even though Jill is left worse off. I think that because the good is tethered, this makes no sense. It is simply better for Jack and worse for Jill. You can't trade off the good of one creature for another. If you want to solve some problem in a way that is good absolutely, that is, if you want to solve it rationally, then you must find a solution that's good from every point of view, one that produces a good that we can share. And that means that our commitment to the view that animals are ends in themselves requires us to find ways of interacting with them and sharing the world with them that are good for us all. Not good in the aggregate, but good for each and every one of us. The standard set by this conception is a high one. In fact, it's impossibly high. The system of nature sets the interests of animals against one another, while human morality demands that we seek common good. For all that, I believe that we must do the best that we can. Now, I think by putting these points about the nature of pleasure and the nature of the good together, we can bring out something really fundamental in the way of a difference between the utilitarian and the Kantian cases for the moral standing of animals. In his commentary on Ketsi's The Lives of Animals, Peter Singer voices the common view that the fact that human beings anticipate and plan for the future means that human beings have more to lose by death than the other animals do. Singer imagines an interlocutor uh, <coughs> protesting that death for a non-human animal, his example is a dog named Max, would mean the loss of everything for Max. And Singer replies to the interlocutor 
that although there would be no more good experiences for the dog Max, they could arrange for the breeding of another dog, and then this other dog could be having good canine experiences Max, in Max's place. In other words, what matters is not the goodness of Max's experiences for Max, but just that there be good experiences going on in the world somewhere. It's as if what makes the dog matter is that his consciousness is a location where good things happen. As Singer himself puts it musingly in an earlier paper, it's as if sentient beings are the receptacles of something valuable, and it doesn't matter if a receptacle gets broken as long as there's another receptacle to which the contents can be transferred without any getting spilt. And that's the problem. Traditional utilitarians regard the subjects of experience in general essentially as locations where pleasure and pain, which they see as good and bad experiences, happen, rather than seeing sentient beings as beings for whom these experiences are good or bad. To put it another way, they think that the goodness or badness of an experience rests wholly in the character of the experience and not in the way the experience is related to the nature of the subject who has it. So it's not essential to the goodness of the badness of the experience that it's good or bad for the subject who has it. The view that pleasure and pain are sensations harmonizes well with this aspect of traditional utilitarianism since a sensation seems to carry its character within it. But I think this is wrong. What matters about suffering is that it's someone's suffering. If you could really cut the tether between the suffering and the creature whose suffering it is, which of course you can't, then the suffering wouldn't matter at all. We should not care about people and animals because they're the places where good and bad things happen in the world. We should care about people and animals because things can be good or bad for them. It's our fellow creatures, not their experiences, to whom we must assign moral standing and that we must treat as ends in themselves. Now, I might have made that last point by saying that the claim that pleasure just is intrinsically good is just as much a piece of metaphysics as the claim that rational beings just are intrinsically valuable. The position I've laid out in this lecture and the last one is intended to be, in a certain philosophical sense, naturalistic. I haven't been able to explain why I think animals have moral standing without at the same time explaining my views on a much larger question, which is why there's such a thing as value in the world at all. The story I've told is not naturalistic in a reductive sense. I haven't argued that value is reducible to any natural condition or fact. Rather, it's naturalistic in the sense that explains the existence of value in terms of the act of valuing and explains the existence of valuing as something that arises necessarily within the point of view of two forms of conscious life. First of all, there's the point of view of sentient animals who are led to pursue their own good by responding favorably to the things that are good for them and aversively to the things that are bad for them. And so are bearers of a good in the final sense of good. And second, there's the point of view of rational animals who are conscious of all this and endorse what is good for themselves as good absolutely, in this way conferring value on themselves and on animals in general. To understand why there's such a thing as value, we need only understand the connection between value and conscious life itself. People are sometimes startled when I describe Kant's philosophy as being in any sense naturalistic, but in the sense I've just described, it is. Kant explains the things that look metaphysical and mysterious in terms of the way our cognitive powers work, in terms of the presuppositions of rational activity. So although Kant himself did not endorse the idea that we have obligations to the other animals, I think there's nothing surprising in the fact that a case for the standing of animals can be made in his philosophical terms. Kant's uh, commitment to epistemic modesty his dictum that we cannot have any knowledge beyond the scientific is an acknowledgment of the human place in nature, 
of our limitations as well as our special status. Kant denied that human beings have an insight into the nature of things as they are in themselves. I think he believed it would really only make sense to ascribe that kind of insight to ourselves if we knew that the world was created by a God in whose image we knew that our own minds were created. Yet Kant did believe that as rational beings, we can bring a measure of intelligibility and reason into the world, both through our powers of theoretical understanding and through our capacity for moral action. What's special about human beings then is not that we are the universe's darlings whose fate is absolutely more important than the fates of the other creatures who like us experience their own existence. It's exactly the opposite. What's special about us is the empathy that enables us to grasp that the other creatures are important to themselves just as we're important to ourselves and the reason that enable us to draw the conclusion that follows that every animal must be regarded as an end in herself whose fate matters and matters absolutely if anything matters at all. Thank you.